Hi, I'm meteorologist Evan Bentley, and in this section we'll be talking about thunderstorm hazards. First hazard we'll be speaking about is straight line winds. So straight line winds are outflow from a thunderstorm that blow in one direction. Uh, the damage is usually more widespread than tornadoes, but usually less extreme. So there might be a tree, several trees down throughout a city, whereas when a tornado goes through, it might be a lot of trees down in an isolated area of the city. This video here is a great example why you need to shelter from straight line winds. Here a trash can actually comes through and hits someone. Um, this is at a St. Louis Cardinals game. And you see just how strong those winds are outside the stadium. Fortunately everyone's protected here inside of the stadium except for anyone who was daring enough to walk out in front of this doorway uh, with those strong winds moving through. One of the more extreme hazards of straight line winds is what's called a derecho. These cause widespread wind damage, with winds often exceeding 100 miles per hour. This is the case from June 29th of 2012, uh, where we actually had a 91 mile per hour wind gust at Fort Wayne. Uh, this storm system developed over northern Indiana and continued eastward all the way off the east coast of the, of the U.S., uh, where it hit our nation's capital around midnight. Um, there were widespread power outages between here and there, over two million people without power, and this was in the heart of a summer heat wave. So many people were then without air conditioning for the next several days. So it was really quite unfortunate timing as well. Here are the storm reports from that event. You can see the wide swath of blue here. These are all the wind reports uh, that were here, and the uh, actual black squares are uh, wind speeds that actually exceeded hurricane force. And so you can see those are really focused here uh, east of Fort Wayne through Lima and then continuing to Columbus, Ohio is where the most extreme portion of the storm was. The next hazard we'll talk about here is hail. Hail forms when water droplets are lifted above the freezing level by an updraft and they freeze um, and then they will continue down below the freezing level again, get coated with water be pulled back above the freezing level and freeze again. This process will continue until that updraft can no longer hold on to the hailstone itself and the hailstone then falls to the ground because it's too heavy. Um, and at this point when it falls to the ground it'll do some melting on its way down but then whatever reaches the surface will be what our hail size is there. A lot of times you'll get hail sizes about like this. Um, when we're reporting hail size as a storm spotter, you're looking for the largest stone. So for an example here, this one might be the one you're looking at. Looks like it's slightly larger than a quarter, maybe uh, about one and a quarter inch, half dollar size hail. This picture here is actually one of the largest hailstones ever fell on record. This is over seven inches in diameter and it fell in Aurora, Nebraska. Uh, this hailstone was actually known to put holes in people's roofs, come through people's skylights, and do some extreme damage. Another hazard that we deal with on a regular basis is flash flooding. Um, flash flooding is caused by localized heavy rain from thunderstorms. Generally about three to five inches in less than three hours is plenty enough to have flash flooding concerns. This is typically a greater issue in urban areas. That's because of all the additional uh, runoff that you have because you don't have as many green spaces where the water will be soaked into the ground. You have a lot of runoff, a lot of blacktop space, things like that. Some of the impacts can be washed out roads and bridges, um, forced evacuations, and structural damage. Another thing that makes it unfortunate in these circumstances is that with flash flooding there isn't a lot of warning. Um, a lot of times it's less than 30 minutes warning uh, before the flash flooding starts to occur. So it's important to keep an eye out on your conditions that you're surrounded by to make sure you never drive into flooded water. You don't want to end up like these cars here or you don't want to drive into water and find out that the road is washed out like here and have your car taken away. So it's always safe to uh, go by the motto when flooded turn around, don't drown. Uh, that's what we like to teach people is to turn around, don't drown. It's the safest way you can be during a flash flooding situation. Here's a video of flash flooding uh, where we have this person here in this white car who decided that they wanted to drive into this uh, water. They didn't think it was that deep, but sure enough, the roads washed out here and there they go. It starts to float the car and it continues to float downstream. Um, unfortunately, um, inside of this vehicle at this time is a woman and her child. Uh, she's got a child looks like in about 8 to 10 years old or so in the back of this vehicle. Um, and fortunately, as the video uh, moves forward here, this car will actually be stopped by a bridge and there'll be a good Samaritan here who will come out and help them out of their vehicle um, to, so that they were able to to survive this experience that they didn't have anything worse happen to them. So you can see them get caught by the bridge here um, and then we've got the uh, Good Samaritan who sees their 
sees their vehicle and he'll come out here at the end of the video uh, to help pull them out of the vehicle. Here's the Good Samaritan coming on out um, and he uh, sees that there's someone in the vehicle who needs help and he goes ahead and helps them out. Fortunately, this bridge held throughout. Um, this bridge could have given way, and he would have been in trouble too. But uh, he put he put his life in jeopardy to make sure that he saved this young this woman and her young child. You can see here, I'm approaching the end of the video, where he uh, pulls the child out of the vehicle. Right. So also another. A uh, thunderstorm hazard is tornadoes. Uh, a tornado is a violently rotating column of air extending from a thunderstorm in that it's in contact with the ground. Uh, in the United States, we see over a thousand tornadoes annually. In our forecast area, we generally see around nine. So it's not one of our greatest risks, but it is something that we do have here in this part of the country every year, typically. One thing that we'll note here is that it is a violently rotating column of air extending and in contact with the ground. It doesn't have to be the condensation funnel. For example, down here, this is a tornado, but it doesn't actually extend the condensation funnel all the way to the ground. Seeing that debris at the ground is what causes it to be a tornado. So here's the EF scale. Um, EF0 to EF1 tornadoes are 65 to 110 miles per hour. They're generally short-lived with a track of less than three miles or so. They develop quickly um, and sometimes without warning. Uh, EF2 to EF3 tornadoes, they've got stronger wind speeds of 111 to 165 miles per hour. They generally track 10 to 15 miles or so, uh, and we detect these better with radar. It's a lot easier to see these stronger wind speeds. Then EF4 and EF5 tornadoes, they have wind speeds of 166 to 200 mile per hour plus. Uh, they can track 20 to 50 miles or even longer. And they can last up to an hour um, or even longer than that we've seen in some cases. And they develop from well-organized supercell thunderstorms. And this is the type of damage you might see from an EF-40, EF-5 tornado. On the left are how often we see each tornado type in our forecast area. You can see 82% of our tornadoes are EF-0 or EF-1, while 17% are EF-2 to EF-3, and less than 1% are EF-4 or EF-5, fortunately, in this part of the country. Finally, with thunderstorm hazards, lightning. Uh, lightning is caused by ice particles colliding in the clouds. Um, it creates static electricity, uh, just like you have when you're rubbing your feet on the ground, except it's a lot more extreme. Um, there, it's a lot bigger process um, within a thunderstorm. Uh, lightning does not make a thunderstorm severe, though. That's one thing to note. And no matter how vivid, impressive, or deadly it is, just because there's a lot of lightning in a storm doesn't mean that it is severe. But lightning can cause a lot of damage. Here's an example of a tree that was struck by lightning. Uh, and so that's why we always say make sure you don't stand under a tree in lightning. Um, and here's another case of why uh, you shouldn't be standing underneath a, a tree during a lightning storm.